Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. Today my guest is Bob Miles. He's the founder and CEO of Salad Technologies, an innovative company that is confronting the computation crisis. We're also going to talk about digital scarcity. There's a lot of topics on innovation in this episode. Let's talk to Bob. Drop in the untold stories of industry leaders, influencers, and insights on future innovation. I'm John Davidson, and this is the DLC DLC Drop Drop Podcast. Podcast. All right. Thank you so much for joining me today, Bob Miles, founder and CEO of Salad. Uh, Thank you for joining me today on the DLC Drop Podcast. John, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so I have watched quite a bit of content, um, you doing interviews to get to know you a little bit. Um, I was excited to get you on here to, to tell your career story, but why don't you give the audience an opportunity to understand what is Salad and what do you do? Yeah, so so Salad, um, interesting name for, for what we do. We're the owners of Salad.com. Um, that's a whole nother story, but we, we have a, an open source application that allows gamers to turn their idle gaming PCs, powerful ga- gaming PCs into games, gift cards, subscriptions, and, and other digital content. And so, so here at Salad, we see uh, you know, every connected computer having meaningful value these days. And um, we, we've got a product that makes it easy for, for gamers to, to actually extract and, and realize that value. So uh, this is all part of Web3 and the metaverse and everything that everyone's talking about uh, these days. So hopefully we can get stuck into that conversation, but a little bit more about myself. Uh, you can tell by the accent, not, uh, not from the States, John, I'm originally from Australia. I've been in the States for about five, just shy of six years now. Um, I have worked in product in the startup space for many, many years now, about a decade. Um, prior to that in Australia, uh, I worked on, um, a TV show I executive produced and starred D-grade talent in a Netflix series called The Green Way Out and, and prior to that, um, studied engineering. That's that's the abridged version. Wow. So it sounds like you've been all over the place. What was kind of your, what was the starting point of that? What, what was your first step into the real world? Uh, for example, my, my career path has been all over the place. I was almost a welder, you know, I had skateboarding opportunities. I skateboarded for a living, not a glamorous living. <laughs> sometimes it paid all the bills. Sometimes it paid none of the bills. Telemarketing, door-to-door vacuum sales. But I had no idea that, number one, I would be hosting a podcast, You know that I would do marketing and esports and things of that nature. So what was that first foray into the professional world that may or may not be linked to what you're doing today? Mate, I, I, I love that. I feel, John, that's representative of careers today is what you just described. My best mate's actually a, a welder turned hotelier. Uh, but, but but answering your question, uh, so I started out in school, all I ever wanted to be was a pilot. So you know, got the job at Macca's, um, McDonald's, saved up, got my license at the age of 18 and quickly realized this is not for me. You know, it's, a, <laughs> it's an industry... Yeah. Yeah, well, mate, it was good. I learned that at 18, but, but the, the main grievance I had with it was there's no room for creativity, right? Mm. So, you know, you don't want your pilot trying something new every time he, he or she takes <laughs> off. So um, that yeah. promptly, yeah. So, so you know, I, I need a creative outlet in my life and, and, you know, ideally that's work, that's your career. So um, not knowing what I wanted to do, I took myself off to uni, spent six years studying, socializing, um, drinking beers um, at university, studying engineering. Um, And then I actually got a job. So so I studied aerospace engineering. And um, yeah, well, there there were, there were, I mean, mate, it was, it was, yeah, I got through it. We'll, We'll put it that much, put it that way. But there were only, So there were 70 of us each year who studied this. And in Australia, there is no aerospace industry. It's all here in the States with the big defense contractors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I I was one of the lucky two people who got hired by Qantas, one of our airlines in Australia. How many people people were uh, trying to get into that program? Were you two of two or were you two of 
hundred. No, two of two of two of. I mean, I would say a lot of people who studied at least at my uni, the seventy odd people, um, you know, their dream job was was what I've about to describe performance engineering within um, a major airline. So there was competition. I was, I was lucky to have met the right person, got an internship there. And, you know, it's the age old who, you know, not what, you know, um, John kind of scenario. So um, that landed me in a suit and a tie for, for all but nine months because what I, what happened so soon. So early on as I recognized you know, I had my little cubicle uh, and my desk within that cubicle. The guy next to me had been hired five years before me. The guy next to him, 10 years before me. The guy oh, next yeah. to him, 15 years before yeah. me. Yeah, mate. So the writing was on the wall. The perks were great, you know, cheap flights, but it just wasn't for me. So the DLC Drop podcast is sponsored by Ice Shaker. I've been a huge fan of this brand for the past few years, ever since I met founder Chris Gronkowski. Uh, what I love about this product is the brand story, the functionality, and the customization. iShaker is a Shark Tank company invested in by Mark Cuban and Alex Rodriguez, owned by NFL players Rob Gronkowski and Chris Gronkowski. I love using my ice shaker anytime I'm driving to the podcast studio, I'm going skateboarding, or I'm at the gym. No matter what I'm doing, it just does a great job of keeping my drinks hot or cold. The customization for ice shaker is something that's super unique. You can get any name, just about any logo engraved onto your ice shaker and delivered to you within just three to five business days. Get your own DLC Drop branded ice shaker at icesaker.com forward slash DLC Drop. Save 20% on all ice shaker products with the discount code DLC Drop. You're not leaving um, that cubicle for the next 20 years is what I'm getting from that. Exactly, mate. Exactly. And then this kind of came back to that same kind of um, itch that I needed to scratch, which is which is a bit of creativity um, in, in what I do. So... Um, that's where I, I, at this cubicle, at this deck, at this desk, spent some time learning about, um, I'd come across waste to fuel mm. technologies and turning waste vegetable oil, um, waste fat into biodiesel. And so I had designed this trailer that you could tow behind your car uh, your diesel truck and turn these waste oils and fats into to biofuel. Wow. Um, and that little seed is what led to, yeah, so designed this thing, built it. My mate, who I mentioned before, who's a welder, was the guy who actually built it. And we built a boat together. And from the bottom of Australia, Tasmania, the island, to the top of uh, the country, the continent, Darwin, we drove about 11,000 miles without filling up at a petrol station. That was the TV show, um, The Green Way Up, that ended up on Netflix. Wow, so you guys are basically going all over Australia smelling like french fries, probably. Oh, mate, french fries and body odor and chicken shops, exactly. Like, that That was that was eight weeks of my life. Um, so, 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 yes, left the airline, worked on that project for about three years, um, you know, worked on the side, funded it ourselves, had no idea what we were doing and somehow produced this thing into, into a 12 part um, TV series. So that was kind of the big leap I would say within my career and kind of gave me the, the confidence to, to take on new challenges outside of, um, you know, my area of expertise. Yeah, that's super cool. I think it, it really takes a lot to jump into something that you've never done before and be comfortable figuring it out as you go. Um, in fact, I think that's one of the challenges when applying for a job, you read that job description where no human on earth <laughs> can actually fulfill what they're asking. And you say, hey, let's go, let's figure it out. Or your boss at work asks you to do something new. You haven't done it before. But just, I think that ability of, I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna try it anyway. I haven't done this. Um, talk a little bit about that and just like that mindset. Is that something that you developed over time or was that something that you were born with a little bit? It's a great question, mate. Um, I think, I think there's, there's 
two things here to, to, to take that on. Um, first being, predictions have to be right. Okay, so you can't you can't make a move like this if you've got a family, kids, and a mortgage. You know, your risk tolerance is completely different. Um, yeah. But but the second thing you need to 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 kind of make a move like that is um, um, a, a, a degree of of I guess delusion is perhaps the word or or, or confidence in yourself deluded to the point where you don't really know what you're doing, but you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the Dunning Kruger effect. You're kind of early, you're just getting into it enough where you think you can handle this, but the more time you spend on a certain topic or a discipline, you come to realize how little you actually know. That's, that's Dunning Kruger loosely. Um, so it takes that, that um, uh, delusional confidence to sink your teeth into, into something entirely new that you don't have the skill set. But that said, I think in this day and age, the pace at which the world is moving, um, that is the absolute uh, critical skill set for anyone coming into the workforce mm. today. You know, the, the traditional career, boomer career, um, where you, you, you know, toe the party line, follow the follow the path that's laid out in front of you throughout a career that's that doesn't exist anymore and so here at salad um uh where, where i work the one thing we control for john the one thing we look for with new hires is is the ability to to work with a little bit within a little bit of ambiguity and default down to initiative when a certain answer or trajectory or, 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 you know, project isn't clearly defined because by definition, we're a startup very early doing something new, we, you know, you need that characteristic. So um, that, that bleeds throughout the company today. That's really cool. I think too, there's also a balance. I mean, it's great, right? When people have the confidence and they're willing to jump into something that they've never done before, great let me let me try it obviously you don't want to do that if you're flying an airplane but if you're doing marketing or business development or uh corporate partnerships uh i i have the experience where i got a couple jobs that i was definitely not qualified for because i thought i was and so i was so confident that i nailed these interviews and then i get these jobs and i'm like uh holy crap i had no idea uh that this is what it entailed now there's a difference between being fearless, being courageous, being ambitious and taking initiative, but also you have to be able to do the job at some point, right? Because if you're just going into stuff that you're unafraid of, but don't know how to do, uh, ultimately you're going to fail. You're going to get fired. You're going to result, you know, provide poor results and then a bad reputation. Like, yeah, this guy <laughs> has confidence, but, uh, he's like that singer at American Idol who thinks they can sing. Uh, but the marketing version, what is, what is kind of that balance of having that courage and going and trying new things, but also making sure that, yeah, you're for, you're fulfilling your promises at the same time. Yeah, I, I would say it comes down to the character, doesn't it? Those who are self-aware and recognize like I am out of my depth here, mm -hmm. um, and can actually tackle that problem themselves uh, that is one I'm, I'm, you know, speaking at each end of the spectrum here, but that is one end. The other would be, well, hell I've made it so far. Um, and, and let's just see how long this, this ride can last, um, until the inevitable. So, uh, I can speak, I can speak from sort of how we handle it here at, at salad, which is, you know, it's the worst part of my job, John. Sometimes people simply aren't a fit for the role and sometimes it's not their direct fault through exercising a little bit too much confidence in the job interview. Um, sometimes it's just, hey, like we're all figuring this out. Maybe your appetite for, for this level of uncertainty or, or um, you know, the need for this a certain level of initiative and trial and error um, some people aren't willing to go down that path um, is sort of incongruent with the role. And so um, 
we actually have, you know, it happens from time to time here at Salad where people have to get let go because they're the, the not not the right person for the role. They're not delivering, not, not, you know, um, generating for the team, and it's it's a horrible part of of the job. But it's it's a reality that hey, you know, we have to talk about it. I'm very thankful to Arlo Vance, who is our brand director here at Salad, who has established a very strong brand book in terms of who we are, what we do, how we hold ourselves and what our brand pillars are. And yeah. it is through those three brand pillars that I can anchor any one of these decisions in and start to have these conversations around um, as sort of a, an anchor for the conversation. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of times when we're thinking of layoffs, we're thinking about the the employee who's getting laid off, right? Whether that's us or you feel you feel bad for that person, but it's also a major challenge for the for the company, right? Is it's super expensive to hire somebody for about the first year? They're they don't know how to do their job a lot of times, or not they're not you know uh, bringing their full value until about a year typically, and you're taking a massive risk. And then if that person doesn't work out, it's not like, oh, I laid you off and my problems are are solved. It's, no, I laid you off and now I need to find another person who's going to do this role. And hopefully, you know, I find a more qualified person. What is that like? Or I guess, how is that accomplished successfully from your perspective as a CEO? It's a brilliant question, John. It's not one we, we talk about often, is it? Because... Mm-hmm. You know, in in the interaction of someone getting fired, it's 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 the employee that we tend to empathise with and think about because that's who it's it's very relatable to. But um, so so it's kind of awkward to talk about it from from the other side because you know the decision is always made from this side, and the the way I have to think about it and the way I kind of rationalize it. I mean, it is case by case, uh, sure. of course. So, but, but the one commonality across all of such events and such decisions is um, we, we are, so we are a bit of context here. We're a venture funded stuff. So we are, yeah. we have venture capitalists behind us. We, we are introducing this radical new product. It's a massive market. If we can hit, escape velocity and, and, and be successful with it. Um, but the nature of the beast, the nature of venture funding is that you are constantly optimizing for growth and not profitability. So you are constantly mm. essentially running out of money. And so when you think about the collective team, the 20 um, plus overseas employees, 26 that we have today, um, these decisions are made for those individuals to protect the integrity of that burn rate, minimize the speed at which we're running out of money, yeah. um, maximize our potential and our opportunity to actually hit escape velocity. Um, the decision is made for those other 20 people. Um, and, and that is kind of the calculus that, that is made on, on the business side, at least early stage and in a situation we're in we're in today. So it's, um, you know, that's a big, big part of the, the rationale that goes behind it. Um, but, but really it's, it's kind of case by case. Yeah, no, I hear that. And it's, it's really interesting because as I was thinking through it, I, I was thinking in this, you know, big bureaucracy, you know, type of a type of a job situation. But what you're demonstrating here is in the VC world, everything is just, maximized right everything is super fast uh the investors are trying to get in blow this thing up get out and then do that again and so what i'm hearing from you is that because everything has to be maximized there's not a lot of room for waste right and so there's a there's definitely a um what is there a a higher fast fire fast type of a uh, i think i've heard gary vaynerchuk uh use that term. But the other thing, I've talked to some people who have built teams and uh, if it's not a fit uh, for your company with this individual, it's not a fit for that individual with the company either. And while it's tough love, maybe it's the toughest form of love, but you are helping that person say, look, of your 
different opportunities that you may have, this is not one of them. You know, let me help you get to that next step that you need to more quickly. And that's tough. And it's hard to say I love you <laughs> in that way. But I think that's really the reality of the matter. Mate, totally. So so this, this makes me think of something my grandmother said. And I say this a fair bit. This stuck with me. Uh, present pain for future gain. It's it's that type of scenario. Um, and, and that's, you know, so applicable to, to what you just described. Present pain for future gain. I love that. Present that pain point. for future gain. Really? So, so I've lived in my life thinking that was that was pretty common, but perhaps uh, perhaps Wendy was under something there. Not in the United States, apparently. Maybe that's an Australian term. So we're getting a little international wisdom here today on the podcast. Um, how does that manifest? Uh, that that statement, present pain for future gain. How is that manifested in your life in other ways? Oh gosh, uh, John. So, so well, I, I think uh, you know, keeping within the context of startups, uh, I so when I started sa- uh, salad, no salary for the first eight months. That was a present pain for a future gain scenario. That's that's you know, it's the first thing that kind of comes to mind. But um, I, I I think the amount of data points that's applicable to don't ask me to name more because I struggle to come up with these things on the fly, but it's, I mean, it's, it's a very, well, you can either apply it to your life or you can choose not to and stay comfortable, but, True. but really to, to keep growing and keep, you know, expanding through life. I, I think present pain for future gain is, is something that you can apply across many, many different aspects. You know, the, the one step back, two step forward, type uh, maneuver is is often you know painful at, at first but but worthwhile in the long run yeah you know uh, very coincidentally um i gave a ted talk about four years ago and the thesis statement was you could put it a different way but the thesis statement was the ability to delay gratification while focusing on a long-term goal brings success and essentially what i uh was uh, detailing in that talk was the result of the things that I love and enjoy are oftentimes the result of consistently accomplishing things that I don't really like to do. And so I use the examples of like, I like to be fit. I mean, obviously look at me. I'm just kidding. But (laughs) I like to be fit, but I hate cardio, right? Um, I don't always like to, uh, you know, choose the salad.com over, you know, the cheesecake. And uh, a a number of different uh, things there. But I think so many times in this immediate gratification world, we are just focused on what am I doing today? What am I getting in this moment? Rather than tomorrow, weeks, months, years down the road, what will this provide in my life? Present pain for future gain. Mate, a hundred percent. And you, you, you mentioned something that I've really been thinking about a lot recently, which is, the environment in which we all live, um, a climate of instant gratification. And we have been, I see it in myself, we have been molded by the last 10 or 15 years of web 2.0 and the services and the interactions that we have online there. You know, the business model of the internet is all about attention, capturing it and maintaining it. And so, True. Now that we have these vessels, you know, phones that we all carry around in our pocket where that can access us, you know, at any time of the day, a lot of people, you know, you can't sleep at night, you'll just sit on your phone. But we are now interacting with this portal that on the other side um, is incredibly powerful and, and um, uh, sophisticated algorithms designed to capture and maintain our attention. And what the net result is, is we actually lose our attention span, lose our ability to focus. And I certainly see it, oh, yeah. you know, in myself interacting with social media. And the reason for us here at Salad is we're introducing this model that's a completely new business model for the web, which is instead of sharing your attention and letting 
you know, these platforms essentially sell your attention to advertisers. Mm -hmm. um, we're allowing you to, to monetize your compute resources when you're not using them. But the problem, the problem we have is the average PC on our network generates five cents an hour when running our software. Okay. So that's over, that's 34 dollars a month you know that's good if you're running this thing 24 7 that's meaningful but how do you capture individuals who are discovering your software for the first time in the first minute of running their owning 0 0.02 cents yeah um how, how do you how do you reconcile this age of immediate gratification with this entirely new value proposition we're introducing. We do a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about here at Solid. That's really interesting. You're basically, you're targeting a group of people who have short attention spans, who either require or desire immediate gratification and are using, used to seeing things instantly. But your value proposition is, hey, if you're patient, <laughs> this will be beneficial for you. Do I have that right? Nailed it. So yeah. how do we have get you, through to these have, have, How do we get through? Well, mate, I was hoping you'd give me the answer. <laughs> John, that's why I'm here. Well, I'll tell you this. You know, you talk about uh, phones. I have a six-year-old son. And, you know, so I really see a lot of things through him. And uh, the other day we're driving around and I was telling him how we used to not have GPS on our phones. We, we didn't have a GPS device we could carry with us. And this kid's mind is just blown. Right. He's like, you mean you didn't. How did you know where you were going to go? And I was like, well, Johnny, part of it is because we didn't have this device that remembered everything for us, that gave us knowledge for everything, quite literally in the world. We remembered how to drive places. <laughs> and I'll tell you what. Um, I you know, one one of the things I see in myself with uh, with our technology, that's, you know, a drawback is simply, I don't know how to get anywhere unless Google Maps is telling me how to get there, right? And I even make a point to try to put, if I've gone somewhere two or three times, then I'll try to put my phone away and I try to do it on my own. Because, I, I mean, I'll even come to the podcast studio sometimes. I'm, I'm Googling how to get here. Dude, this is like my 60-something episode. I don't know how to get to the podcast studio. It's a problem. How do we maximize the benefits of this technology and mim minimize these very obvious and growing drawbacks? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, I, I actually don't think it's a problem with one condition. Okay. As, as, as long as, well, I'm, I'm talking about the skills needed to survive in the world now, not so much our attention span. That is a problem. But in terms of maintaining our skills to survive in the world, as long as these products and services and platforms continue, um, <laughs> we're yes. good, yeah, right? We're good. If 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 because what they actually represent is um, a tool to maximize human productivity, like it. Yes. it it's one, one way to think about it is it, it's, you know, you've only got so many gigabytes of, of um, storage up there in your hard drive. This is probably a really bad way to think about it, but rather than committing some of that memory to, to the left, right, straight ahead at the second light to get to work, you don't have to think about that. You can commit your thought on that cycle, that drive, that walk to the studio towards something more meaningful or productive in your life. That said, if the day comes that, you know, the solar flare knocks out the internet and every, every computer gets fried, that's where it becomes a real problem. Um, yes. But you know, you know, what's an interesting kind of the negative thought of this, the opposite opposing thought of this is, is, um, you know how we all look at our parents and think, oh my, like they use their phone with their index finger and it's like one <laughs> tap familiar. at a time. And yeah, yeah you, you know how it is. Um, eventually we're all going to be those old people. And, and True. Um, your son asking that question, having his mind blown about how you used to navigate without the use of a blue dot on your smartphone. Mm -hmm. um, our minds... Will will 
slowly be blown by by or perhaps where frogs that will be boiled by this rapid change in technology that the younger generation will completely understand and be native to, mm -hmm. but it'll be completely foreign to us. And so right. the opposite here is there is this digital world emerging. Everyone's talking about it as the metaverse and, and you know, web three, where that younger generation is going to be native to it. And we are going to feel like the boomers tapping our phone with our index fingers, trying to interact with everyone in this strange new world, which is, which is very digital. So um, the, the, the one opposite is almost true as long as, as long as, you know, things, things hold together in terms of technology <laughs> yeah, and those services. Fingers crossed, sticking right? Around. I, I once heard somebody say that where we are in technology currently is that everything that we're developing is predicated on what's been developed before. And so to your point, what that means is like, yeah, we have all these businesses based on the internet, but the internet has to work for all of these things to happen. And I think when you talk about, okay, kind of the boomer generation or the, you know, the, I don't know how to use technology uh, type of, you know, I, I prefer to call them wise and distinguished individuals. Um, <laughs> you can call them whatever you'd like, Bob, um, but I really appreciate uh, their experiences in life. Uh, and I hope my inheritance is still coming after my mother hears this episode. But, um, <laughs> you know, something that we're, we're experiencing all the time in in my world esports gaming you know <laughs> nfts people don't understand that young people value digital assets digital goods uh digital experience just as much as older generations uh value physical uh you talk about the metaverse a little bit right and so oh my gosh you're gonna you know whether that's ar whether that's vr but you're gonna have this entire digital world that is overlaid or inside our physical world and one thing that I'm really interested in, and I want to bring this back to salad here for a moment, is applying business models that are traditional business models or proven business models to current and innovative technology. And with salad, the way I understand it, it kind of sounds like it's the Uber of, it's an Uber model and airbnb type of a business model but you're per, you're applying this to everybody's individual pcs rather than their cars or their homes do i have that accurately yes this is this is one of the the, the best analogies actually to to describe salad and it, it also describes one of the challenges we face today by that i mean john imagine if i was pitching uber or airbnb to you back in 2007 2008 and i was saying a complete stranger is going to pick you up in their car and drive you from a or a complete stranger is going to stay in your spare bedroom next to you tonight you would have said absolutely not you know there's axe murderers in the world like this is never going to work <laughs> fast forward to to exactly. where we are today it's a part of the zeitgeist right it's absolutely. just it's commonplace uh, we are up against the same type of headwinds here at Salad, which is we're introducing to gamers and, you know, working in a space, you understand how important and precious gaming PCs are to, to gamers that, yeah. uh, you know, that is an important asset that they are proud of and protective of. We are introducing this value proposition of, you know, when you're not using your computer, let essentially let someone else use it and you'll get paid for it. But that what is incredibly that exactly? uncomfortable. When you say let somebody else use it, they're not, you know, typing in your password and like going around using, you know, your Facebook account, right? Like define a little bit more for the audience what specifically that means of someone else is using your computer. Yeah. So so it's actually far less invasive than the business model of today, which is people profiling you, uh, getting sort of a fingerprint of your persona so that they can hone the marketing machine to advertise to you um, and, and sell your personal data. Completely different. So so we are entering this age where, and, and this is really Web3, what I'm describing, where there will be these peer-to-peer protocol-based communities, marketplaces, ecosystems, um, uh, uh, where to run 
they must operate across infrastructure. And and right. so so when I say are the people using your PC today, one of the primary workloads with Salad is actually securing the Ethereum network through proof of work yeah. mining. So it is by no means someone coming in and kind of remote desktoping in and like using your PC in the traditional sense. It is essentially a library that is constantly hashing or, 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 or um, competing against other computers in a proof of work algorithm to secure the network and verify the transactions that happen across this network, transactions which people are making. So, so there's, there's layers to this onion. Um, but where it gets really interesting, and this is the future we're looking towards, John, um, Satya Nadella is the Microsoft CEO. Earlier this year, he, he at Microsoft Ignite, their big annual conference, he said, we are at peak centralization. The future of the cloud is decentralized and ubiquitous. And, and what the way we interpret that is every individual with their self-sovereign server, so their own machines, will be able to contribute their compute resources towards these protocols, these, these marketplaces, these ecosystems to power different aspects of the web. But beyond that, every individual will actually be able to compete with cloud providers because we, we've reached a really interesting point in history where 15 years of cloud technologies so that is orchestration containerization things like docker if you've heard of it uh -huh. they now ship native to consumer devices and okay. so when it's really interesting what happens now is let's say you have an artificial intelligence workload you can actually share your computer and get paid to calculate that workload so this is sharing it, your computer with someone else letting else them use it not remote desktoping in but they will send you a workload and on your computer we can set up a fully secure compute environment that cannot see outside any of the workloads. If it's nefarious, a bad actor can't actually see into your computer. It's a container. This is how cloud servers actually you don't work. Have to worry about getting executed by exactly. Yeah, exactly, mate. So let me try to put it in uh, terms that work for my simple mind, <laughs> and you you tell me if this is accurate. So it sounds like it is the power of your computer that is being leveraged so that utilized to do work while your computer otherwise would not be doing any work. Is that exactly somewhat correct? And so, exactly. Okay. So to put this towards an, I'm trying to think of an analogy, like a physical analogy. And this is what I'm coming up with uh, on the fly is my garage. So if my car is out of my garage, cause I'm out driving around you get to put a bunch of boxes in there while my garage is empty. And then when I go come back home, your boxes are gone and I couldn't park back into my garage. Is, is that uh, analogous or is that completely off? <laughs> nope, that's it, mate. You've actually described um, neighbor.com. So they're, they're actually another Utah based startup. They are the Airbnb of like storage space. So, yeah. so that that's exactly it. And, and, Look, it's a, it's a radical new concept today, mm -hmm. but once same, the same way that Uber and Airbnb started to penetrate the mainstream consciousness, the same thing will happen where people will understand that their computer is valuable, you know, mm -hmm. today to the tune of 30 bucks a month, 30 or 40 bucks a month. Yep. It is incredibly safe through containerized technology to actually run and service these different workloads and get paid for that asset that otherwise is sitting there idle with full of latent value. So I think your analogy is good. I think it works. Great. I, I'm 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 super curious as to <clears throat> kind of the motivation be behind or the thought behind the business. And so um, as you look at other businesses, Uber uh, is disruptive, right? And so taxis 
were just the taxi industry was terrible. They basically had a monopoly and Uber basically came in and said, we're going to completely disrupt this industry um, for these uh, for these reasons. Um, There's other reasons to start businesses, whether that be just because you have a great idea. Right. And you're like, hey, there's this thing that's not happening yet that we can do that we can make money doing. And then there's another motive, which is necessity. And kind of what I'm picking, I feel like I'm picking up from you is because there is such a neat, there's so much computer work happening in the world that we are starting to get to a point that these servers, these cloud servers are not enough, but there's a necessity that everybody kind of chip in with what they have and they have an opportunity to make money doing it. Is that accurate or is, is there another motivation? Mate, absolutely. Um, you know, I don't want to be hyperbolic here, but we are marching towards a compute crisis. So it yeah. doesn't matter what vertical you look at. Mm-hmm. AI, its demand for compute resources doubles every four or so months. That was wow. research from OpenAI. NVIDIA has done similar research. We've got the Internet of Things, that is connected devices, 20 billion more devices coming online in the next few years. The infrastructure can't handle that. We've got Web3, this P2P metaverse, you know, internet that's emerging. All of that demands compute resources. Um, Mm. All of that is exponential up and to the right. We do have opposing forces like improvements in software um, that, that optimizes things, you know, Moore's law in the hardware, but that is out being completely outstripped by, by demand. So, um, we are marching towards a future where the pressure will be alleviated by either technology, something like quantum computing, handling it, uh, you know, a step change in, in computing power or a pressure valve that we see being more likely is a lot of these workloads being run across consumer devices. That's what we're looking to facilitate here at Salad. Um, is that a rooster? <laughs> yes. Sorry, mate. Where that's are a, that's you a rooster. Um, I'm, I'm at home, but um, <laughs> that thing. So my wife actually, she she um, she painted a bullseye on that thing, and that's my job. I got to get rid of it because because it's got no sense of whether it's five in the afternoon or two in the morning. And, I was going to say, right what time is it, is it, you know, is it, <laughs> is it dawn and uh, you've been up early with us or do you just have a rooster whose clock, is, internal clock is off? <laughs> hey, it, it's time for that rooster to, to move on to a better place is what it is. But, but anyway, that's, 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 yeah, that's, uh, that's a saga at our household, that rooster. Um, oh, but look, the, the, we're talking about compute crises here. Um, there's actually, there's actually, there's actually a, there's actually a, a more, pressing crisis arguably which is which is the business model of the internet so it's not so much about demand for compute resources yeah but more so um data and how data is managed who owns it who can utilize it and for what purpose and how Mm. sovereign is that data to you how much control do you have over that data and that that personal um you know, digital persona that you have. So that's a whole different conversation. Yeah. But um, um, you, you know, that that's kind of at the core of Web three as well. Well, it's interesting this computer crisis you're talking about because what I mean, I feel like this is the the episode of analogies as you're explaining things that are very deep and brilliant from your engineering brain, and I'm, you know, bringing this down to Legos level of how I understand it. But it sounds like you know, similar to the industrial revolution right? We created a bunch of stuff that cars, factories, etc. And then we created a need for way more oil or way more energy of different kinds. And now, you know, we're, we're seeing across the world that, you know, we may need to be dipping into some alternative uh, energy solutions. And we created that issue, right? Because we've created so many things that require that. In the same way, with this computer crisis, we've developed not just, I mean, everything is electronic nowadays, right? I mean, shoot, we're talking about NFTs. (laughs) Our goods, our values are, you know, our valuable goods are digital. Our experiences are digital and something has to run all of that. 
And this addiction that we have, whether it be to uh, content, digital experiences, video games, all of a sudden is like, holy crap, we got we got to provide for this. And then the, what I'm hearing from you too, which is mind blowing, is what we are innovating requires vastly more computer power, not less. Yes. So it's yeah, you, exponential, it sounds like. It's it's exponential. Um, you've got to take everything I say with a grain of salt because this is the industry I spend my time in and, and where I spend, you know, my thought cycles. Um, but, but what you describe is absolutely what I see. And, and you know, you mentioned the industrial revolution, um, you know, the invention of the combustion engine or steam engine, combustion engine being kind of one of the pivotal that sort of marked, earmarked that change in history, I believe a very similar change is, is, has occurred, which is the invention of digital scarcity. And, and you know, you mentioned earlier in this conversation, every everything new is built on something that's come in the past. Um, you know, we had the internet. You and I, I, I don't know how old you are, John, but I assume you're of a similar vintage where we grew up with the internet and yep. we understand that control C, control V, copy and paste, everything digital can just be replicated. Right. But with the invention, yeah, with the invention of, of it really it was Bitcoin taking a bunch of different inventions, gluing them together, and for the first time inventing true digital provable ownership and scarcity that all of a sudden we have this entirely new um, way of thinking about value and and you know if you think about where value in the world lies it's very closely correlated to human attention what do we focus on what we focus on tends to be what we value um, as I said before, the average American is now spending seven hours a day interfacing with the screen and the internet. Yeah. And that is a trend that's accelerating. Human attention is starting to focus more and more in the digital space. You marry that with this recent kind of revolution, arguably, you know, evolution, but I would say a revolution of digital scarcity. And all of a sudden you have the making for... Another thing we were talking about before, which is, you know, the boomer generation not understanding what is inherent to young people, which is there is ownership online. You know, that skin, that individual NFT, that unique item yeah. that I understand to be digital and scarce, they, you know, that older generation doesn't. Um, right. That is what we are witnessing and we are at the start line. It's fascinating. That's really interesting. And would you say that the, the blockchain is what enables digital scarcity or is it something else? Yeah, it's, it's, I would say less so the blockchain and, and more the cryptography that, that secures it. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of each to their own in terms of how you look at it, but um, the, the cryptographic security and these different proof of dot, right. dot, dot, algorithms are the things that really secure and facilitate, uh, excuse me, secure and facilitate, um, digital ownership and one other thing to, to, to add to the mix here because you actually mentioned how this will translate into exponential demand for compute resources um, that is absolutely the case and one thing that we argue here at Salad is that the integrity of all digital assets the, the integrity being our common perception of their value is compromised if it is all managed by large centralized monopolies. So, so if all of this value runs on the servers of AWS, GCP, and Microsoft Azure. It's a monopoly all of a sudden. Exactly. And, and that gives them a backdoor to actually start to tamper with and manipulate these different proof of dot, 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 algorithm. So the future we see, this is very far looking and nebulous, but the relationship that we're facilitating here at Salad is not so much one of just receiving that $30 a month worth of Netflix subscriptions and games from your computer, but actually giving, giving and, and powering what is meaningful for you 
within this new web? What is the community, the protocol, the corner of the metaphors that matters to you, your computer power and autonomy um, over, over and, and maintain the integrity of, of this web that, that is now going to blossom with value. That's incredible. So t- share this with me as we're, we're getting near the, the end of this episode is what is the end game for salad? What do you see when right now you're in this rapid growth phase and you guys are doing such amazing things, um, but you're at the beginning, right? Or you're near the beginning of your, of your arc here. Uh, what is success for you and for salad? Success for salad is to, to facilitate this change in in how in our relationship with the web Mm -hmm. rather than individuals being today as you go online and interact with 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 these different platforms and services salad wants wants to facilitate ease you easily contributing your compute resources towards these different um uh, protocols and communities online so that you can subsequently um, uh, participate. So, so our mission statement is to be the easiest and most trusted way to share your idle assets. Um, at, oh, sorry, your, your, your computer, your idle computer. Um, success for Salad is, is maintaining our open source client, um, allowing users to have complete control and autonomy over what their compute resources do and, and to own the relationship with suppliers as the easiest, most trusted way to share your computer. That's super cool. And so um, are you at the point today that if I wanted to, um, you know, make money with my idle assets when I'm not, you know, hosting the DLC Drop podcast or I'm not, you know, doing some consulting or the gazillions of emails in my inbox catching up, um, could I do that today? And how would I be able to take part in that? Yes, yeah, so we, we are very targeted on on one specific cohort, which is gamers today. So, so John, if you have a powerful gaming PC, it is your GPU that really delivers the value for you. There is a catch. Now, running your computer costs electricity. Depends on where you are, maybe 10, 12 bucks a month. Sure. Uh, but if you've got a good GPU, absolutely, mate, you can earn... 30, 40, I got a 2080, that's $60 a month is, is what I've been generating. Hmm. And so where am I going and how am I taking advantage of that? Am I going to salad.com, which is an amazing URL? <laughs> By yes, the way. Salad, salad.com, that's the place to go. We got, um, you know, it is it is radically new. I don't know how much time we got, but but so, so I'll keep this short. But um, salad.com is where you'll find the software. Discord is where you'll find the community. There's, there's 45 thousand plus people in there um we've got reddit um there's heaps of resources around who we are what we do the the software's on um github and and look i recognize we're coming up on the top of the hour here um perhaps this is a question for for next time john but knowing you're in the esports space one of the questions i had for you uh, was we've got 400 million gaming pcs worth let's say 30 bucks a month how is that useful for the esports industry? You know, I can see so many different ways we can stream value during tournaments, support different teams with these latent resources. Absolutely. Perhaps something for another day, but I'd love to have that conversation with you. Well, we do have about seven minutes here, so let me let me tease it for you, and we'll tease it for the audience, and you know, maybe there will be a, a great conversation that we can have once this episode goes live, and we can help facilitate that. But one of the biggest challenges in the esports industry to date is monetization for everybody outside of the publishers. Now, not too long ago, League of Legends, which is the most popular and uh, largest uh, global esports league, announced we have yet to make a profit in esports. Now, for people like myself, it's not shocking because I'm pretty familiar with how the industry works. Um, you know, you see that and it's a, it's more of a reminder, but all of these people who are like, oh, it's a, uh, it's a billion dollar industry. Like you said, 400 million, you know, gaming PCs all over the planet. There's just people making money hand over fist, more eyeballs than the Super Bowl, hundred thousand, you know, people in the, a weekend in Poland, all of these big numbers and you're not turning a profit. What the heck? Right. And 
The problem here is this. The publishers make a lot of money outside of esports and are able to use esports as a marketing loss leader. Mm. Now, they own the IP of the game, which is very unique to sports. In traditional sports, Bob, you and I could start a football league, for example. We could call it John and Bob's Football League, and we would own that IP. We could start a league. We could start teams, etc. No problems. But we couldn't call it the NFL, right? The National Football League. That is taken. Now, if you and I wanted to start John and Bob's Rocket League League or League of Legends League, we can't do that without a license or the permission of the publisher. And so within this ecosystem that is a marketing loss leader for the people who own the IP are all of these teams, these esports orgs who are making the majority of the revenue through sponsorships and the majority of capital coming in this space is coming from investment. But these teams are burning cash as fast as you can imagine. And so what I see an opportunity for you, Bob, I don't have the I don't have the specific answer for you, but I think I've got some ways to lead you down that road is how can we create monetiz- monetization for the teams? Because if the teams are not profitable at some point, you can't have leagues without teams. Investors are going to say, hey, this is not the gold mine. This is not the silver bullet I thought it was. I'm going to put my investment otherwise. And so we as an industry, I'm, you know, I'm the chairman of the Esports Trade Association. And what we try to do there is we try to help improve the business practices of the esports industry, uh, figuring out you know, more stable monetization methods specifically for these teams you know, is one of our leading initiatives. And so I think you might have something there where you have another revenue stream. It's probably not going to change your life. But I could, ha- if I could have another opportunity with all of these PCs that I have, my players have, my team has, etc., that those can be making money while I'm literally sleeping, that sounds like a, a great start. John, it's fascinating, man. I've never thought about, well, I guess I'm just not that deep in the industry, the actual mechanics of, of monetization in esports and you know it's such a hot space right now um, that's a big problem to solve so you've got me thinking you've got me thinking for sure yeah i'll just tease this last piece or you know kind of explain this is the biggest difference uh from a monetization standpoint between traditional sports and esports is media rights so media rights is by far the number one generator in traditional uh traditional sports because it's pro it's traditional programmatic television, and that has a model of media rights. Everything in esports is streamed online, and it's very difficult to figure that out because, number one, there's a data issue as far as, you know, it comes down to numbers, it comes down to audience, what are you selling against? But the other thing is there are so many streams that are pirated. We know this, not just in esports, but every boxing match has, you know, tens of million, you know, 14, 15 million uh, in pirated revenue, right? Um, and so you have all these these streams, you have all of these tournaments uh, on Twitch and what have you. It's very easy to just pirate these things and forego paying for something that you would otherwise. And then there's there's no value there, you know, for the people who are paying for those media rights. So, uh, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I got a lot of questions and I think we'll figure it out over time. It's such a fun space to be in. It sure is. Well, uh, Bob, uh, I, I hate to let you go, but I love to watch you leave. Um, <laughs> we're at the end of this uh, episode here. How can people get in touch with you and Salad in the ways that you would like them to? Yeah, so salad.com is, is where you'll find us. Um, uh, Discord is where our, our community is. I'm actually not too too active on the socials. LinkedIn is about it, where, where you'll find me. Uh, Bob Miles, uh, CEO of Salad. Thank you, John. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Bob Miles, founder, CEO of Salad.com. Hit them up, make some money with those idle PCs. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for joining me, Bob. Thanks, John. Thank you for listening to the DLC Drop Podcast. This podcast is part of the Esports Futuri Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast channel and leave us a review.